Um, welcome everyone in the room and everyone watching on live stream. Allow me to introduce today's panel. We have Stefan Löfven, as close as I'm gonna get, Prime Minister of Sweden, and Magdalena Andersson, Minister of Finance of Sweden. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and, and welcome. Um, the theme of this year's World Economic Forum is responsive and responsible leadership. And it is going to require a great deal of the world leaders to, to meet the concerns we are seeing now in many countries about globalization, unemployment, welfare shortcomings, and, and migration. Resignation is now being manifested all over the world in, in the growth of right-wing popul populism and a tendency also for countries to close themselves off and lean towards protectionism. These concerns have been addressed in different ways and discussed in many meetings here in Davos, and world leaders need to take them very seriously. I am convinced that the, the key to turning these concerns and this frustration into confidence for the future is to be found in more jobs, a strong welfare system, and in something that we social democrats have stood for since, since many, many years, all the time, economic equality. Right now, everyone is actually talking about equality here in Davos and, and in other places also all over the world. Because more and more people are now opening their eyes uh, to the fact that equality is important. It's important for sustainable development, both for the ability to keep the society together and also for growth. The IMF, as well as the OECD, has indicated that there is a positive correlation between a more equal income distribution and growth. So here in Davos, there's a great deal of, of interest also in the, the Swedish model with the labor market that has delivered major increases in, in real wages, uh, a welfare society in which you, your background uh, does not determine your future, making it possible for, for someone like me who once was a foster child, been a, uh, a welder, an industry worker, to become a prime minister. So um, equality has been uh, not only a buzzword, it is becoming the key word in addressing uh, sustainable development. Please, Finance Minister. Thank you, and just as the Prime Minister said, there has been a great deal of interest in the Swedish model here in Davos, the way, the way we have combined high growth, high employment, and equality. And historically, Sweden has been good at ensuring that in the, when the economy grows, everyone gets its fair share. And it looks different in, in different countries, just taking the U.S. as, as an example. In, in, in the U.S., 90% of the population have not seen any wage increases since the 1970s in real wages, whereas at the same time, the top 1% have sen seen their incomes increase by 200%. During the same years in Sweden, the, the picture is completely different, where both the 90% and the 1% have seen their incomes develop at a similar pace. So it's obvious that what policies you choose, what political model you choose, makes a difference. And in Sweden, we, we have seen the way large w or wage increases for broad, uh, for broad groups, mm. wage increases in line with productivity growth, of course, and this is thanks to strong social partners. But we also see high participation rates at redistribution thanks to a well-functioning welfare system. But at the same time, we have most prominently for the last decade also seen increased income inequalities in Sweden. And this has been something that this social democratic-led government has been fighting since day one we took office both because it's the right thing, we think it's the right thing to do, but also because it is smart economics. And just as the Prime Minister said, both IMF and OECD points to inclusive growth being both higher but also more sustainable. And therefore, it is uh, great to see such an interest for the subject here in Davos, both for Sweden as a model, but also for uh, the fact that maybe more can be done going forward. 
And as, as has been said, equality is on, on everyone's lip, lips here in, in Davos, and maybe actually equality is becoming the new black. Uh, and uh, but in order to go forward, this must not stop at, at empty words. We, it's time for leaders to go from words to action. And of course, this is something that we have urged the leaders we have met so far and will continue to urge is to act for change. Mm -hmm. from, a, from a Swedish perspective, greater equality builds on four pillars. More jobs, better jobs, direct redistribution of resources, but also strong welfare system financed through a well-functioning tax system. So let me just start with the first two. Uh, number one, more jobs. Uh, we need more people to have the possibility to have a job to go to, uh, so we must continue to push up employment rates and fund, fight unemployment, both in order to, of course, having a job is, is a feeling of belonging, of pride, of contributing to the society, but it's also very important for uh, everyone's income. And secondly, it's, it's of course not enough to have a job to go to if you cannot earn a living from it. So uh, what we need to see is that the prosperity of our corporations and the gains from globalization needs to be felt in the pockets of the employees. Mm. Um, and that means also that increased trade and prosperity uh, must benefit everyone. And that is what we're seeing uh, today is lacking. And this is why also I've taken the, the initiative for uh, what I call a global deal. That is an international collaboration between working, con uh, uh, sorry, on uh, decent working conditions, for decent working conditions between uh, countries, companies, trade unions and other actors with the aim that the partners should act globally to, to address the challenges of a global labor market and make it possible for all people to benefit from globalization. That must be the aim. I've seen the enormous power of collaboration between the social partners and society and how that creates a win-win-win situation for the individual employees, but also for enterprises, companies, and for the whole society. And, and I urge more of the world leaders to, to join the global deal for decent working conditions globally. It is essential. Now, going back to, to point number three and four, of the, the, the ones that the finance minister mentioned, uh, redistribute resources between various income groups through taxes and transfers is, uh, is very important. Uh, if you want to lessen the gaps, the state has to intervene and move some of the resources from those who have a lot to those who have less. And the fourth point, building a strong welfare system with uh, good schools and health care for all financed through a well-functioning tax system is also crucial. And not only does welfare uh, make people secure, uh, it, expanding childcare and elderly care also mean that women, more women, can participate, work, and this also benefits uh, the whole society, the, the entire economy. And uh, nothing of this is impossible. It can be done, it must be done. And, uh, now it's time to go from words to deeds. Thank you very much. So we have a couple of microphones in the room. So if we can see by show of hand who would like to ask a question to the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance. One at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so no. hmm? if we don't have any questions. No, uh, ah, OK, wonderful. My name is Ruben Moyman. I'm a journalist for the newspaper The Standard in Brussels in Belgium. Um, you talked about a global deal and you said you hope that as many um, participants will join this deal. Have any um, organizations already done that? Have they joined your deal? Yes, we have uh, several countries also from, let's say, from Colombia to, to Cambodia. We have, uh, several, we have 11 countries in total. Those are two examples. Uh, the the um, international trade union organizations. We have companies, enterprises like H&M, uh, uh, and Scania, and uh, ICA Group as well. So yes, uh, uh, several have have joined, but we need more to join. Yeah. 
even if uh, Sweden uh, does not have the same kind of problems like many other countries, we still have a right-wing populist party that is rather strong in parliament. And uh, how do you explain that then? If Sweden has achieved so much economically and still we have a right-wing populist party of that size. Well, I if I just may start shortly and then, then I'll uh, get the floor to the finance minister. Well, we, we have had eight years, before we took uh, office, with eight years with growing inequality with tax reductions for most for the wealthier people and, re and also reducing in the welfare system, creating also in Sweden an insecure system. And what happened in Sweden is the same thing that happens all over the world. If people feel insecure about the future, they turn to the simple solution. Who's got the simple solution in this complex reality? And that happens also in Sweden. What we're doing right now is to change from this uh, just lowering taxes and disinvesting in our welfare system into investing in our common so uh, society, uh, building a welfare society that shows everybody you are on board. You will also have a job. If you lose your job, we will help you to another job. You have your individual responsibility, but we will take also shared responsibility. We will make sure that you get the training. If you're unemployed, we will make sure also together that you can survive, uh, that you don't have to leave everything just because you're poor. These are the things that we are implementing slowly, step by step. We need to take it in, in, a, in, a, in a responsible way. And, and that is what we're showing step by step, how we can change that. Yeah, I, just as the Prime Minister said, I mean, what is driving I think there, there's, of course, there are sev several forces that are driving populism. But I mean, clearly, what two other forces is increased, uh, increased insecurity, but also increased uh, income gaps. And this we have also seen in Sweden during the last eight years. Uh, if you look, for instance, at the at the uh, the pro uh, proportion of households with very low incomes has increased uh, significant, significantly, particularly from 2006 to 2000, 2010, for instance. But we also see how the active uh, redistribution policy we had during the eight years before we entered office was a, a policy that was uh, um, mainly focused on uh, benefiting uh, the uh, uh, those income groups with, with higher incomes compared to those with lower incomes. Uh, and of course with this government we are uh, using uh, the political tools in the other, in the opposite direction. Uh, but what we are seeing in front of us right now is, is that a political landscape uh, is, um, is uh, changing uh, rapidly right in, front of our, right in front of our eyes. And I think, uh, of course, we need to analyze what are the driving forces behind it. And it can be several driving forces, but I am convinced that the increased, in, the increased, inequali the increased inequalities, but also the increased in uh, security is um, two of those important driving forces. Mm. If you could tell us your name and your question. Uh, me? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Kodaki. I'm from Japanese newspaper Nikkei. Um, yesterday, the UK Prime Minister Theresa May made clear that now UK is uh, leaving the single market and now she wants the new trade agreement with the uh, European Union. Uh, could I have your comments and reaction to her speech? And also, are you optimistic about the future and negotiations? Hmm. Well, first, there's still a uh, they have to activate the the, uh, the Article 50 before we start those negotiations. Uh, well, we have stated from the very beginning, uh, since it was clear uh, that the, the British people voted for a Brexit, that we want a pragmatic handling of this situation. It, it is not good for the European Union. Of course, it's not. Uh, it will be problematic. It's very, very, very complex negotiations uh, that we have ahead of us. Um, um, because we, we, at the end of the day, we want also to see, I mean, UK is there and EU is there also after the negotiations. And it, we, we would like to have a good relationship. But having said that, it's also important to say that there is a difference between membership and not being a member. So you cannot expect uh, to have all the good things uh, that, you, that, uh, that you get as a member without having the obligations and the responsibility also. So there must be a difference. And uh, I also think that 
I think not only UK, but everybody needs to think through the timetable for these negotiations because in, in practice we have actually not more than perhaps one and a half year, perhaps a little more, it, because if, if, if it's supposed to take two years for the new to be, implement, be implemented, we have one and a half year. The autumn 2018, and that is a very, very short time for these complex negotiations. So I think, I think um, uh, that um, UK also and the Prime Minister perhaps be, and 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 more, and others as well, perhaps is a bit optimistic on the timetable. I think it's, it is also important that the British government now is more clear on what they actually want to achieve with these negotiations. And that will, of course, simplify the negotiations when we know at least what the, what the other partner is, is looking towards. Uh, I think that's a good thing. Another good thing is that she was also very clear that the UK and the European Union share common values and that she also sees that it is in the interest of the United Kingdom uh, that uh, the European Union is a successful pro project and that we can move forward um, both uh, the EU27 and the United Kingdom. So I would like to thank you all for your questions and of course thank uh, my panelists, Prime Minister of Sweden and Minister of Finance of Sweden um, and everyone who was here in the room with us and definitely our audience on live stream. Thank you. The press conference is closed. <laughs>